Yo, what's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. So today we are going to be reacting to how good was Garchomp actually by False Swipe Gaming. So False Swipe Gaming has been popping off on YouTube over these last few years with some videos getting upwards of a million views apiece. You guys commented a lot on my last reaction video how Exeggutor almost won the world championships by telling me that I should react to some of his videos. And I thought that was a great idea, because you know what? Who better to react to some of his content than someone who is actually mentioned in a number of those videos? So with that said, let's go ahead and smash that like button, and let's jump into the video. How good was Garchomp actually? And as always, this video will start with these competitive formats. As always, let's start out with the stats. You already know, Garchomp is in that special tier of pseudo-legendary Pokemon, meaning it's a 3-stager with a 600 base stat total. And boy are those stats good. In fact, Garchomp's stats are incredibly similar to another pseudo-legendary, Salamence. Yeah, so Garchomp was kind of the first pseudo-legend to be released, where it not only was really, really powerful from an attack standpoint, and it was also really, really fast, but it sped crept the other... Uh, base 600 stat total legendaries and pseudo legendaries like Zapdos, uh, Salamence. So that 102 base speed really meant a lot in that there were so few Pokemon that were really viable at the time that could outspeed and have a good matchup against it. Not only that, it had a lot lower of a secondary attacking type, in Garchomp's case special attack, compared to like Tyranitar and Salamence where they had pretty decent special attack Whereas Garchomp's was pretty mediocre, and so that gave it more stat points for its HP and defenses. So it could be extremely bulky, at the same time being really fast and really powerful. So at the time, its uh, kind of base stat, uh, the way that its base stats were kind of lined up, made it a really, really powerful Pokemon. Garchomp's typing is also one of its biggest benefits. Bear in mind that in pre-fairy days, the only thing that resisted dragon types was steel types. But what's Garchomp's other typing? Ground, of course, meaning many steel types couldn't even stand up to Garchomp. And then those that could resist its dual stab assault or had enough defense to withstand fell victim to its move pool. With Fire Fang, Garchomp ate up any possible roadblocks on its path to destruction. Yeah, typing-wise, Garchomp was just such a major threat offensively. Uh, that ground and steel typing combined just normally dragon types they just got walled by steel types and really that was kind of it there was no fairy type back then and of course what's good against steel types well stab earthquake is good so it was really skarmory bronzong were the only ones that could kind of handle it but they couldn't really do anything to it like they might be skarmory might be able to set up spikes could whirlwind it out uh bronzong i mean didn't really i don't know what it did in singles maybe just set up a stealth rock or something who knows it wasn't really that used i don't think uh, and then there was Fortress, but as mentioned, I mean, Fortress could just get wrecked by any kind of Fire-type coverage that Garchomp had, so there really wasn't a whole lot that could stand up to Garchomp in singles anyway. As if that wasn't enough, Garchomp had access to Sand Veil. Simply the presence of a Hippowdon or a Tyranitar, both incredibly common, gave Garchomp an extra 20% evasion, so even any would-be counters could just get unlucky and lose. Yeah, this was what made Garchomp, and this is both singles and VGC, it made Garchomp one of the most annoying Pokemon to deal with. It's just such a stupid ability, like, there's just no reason for it. There's not really any counterplay, it's just, you know, you're praying to, you know, I don't know, maybe to the YouTube algorithm by smashing that like button down below, in the hopes that your opponent would just miss because of Sand Veil. And back then, if you had Tyranitar and, or uh, Hippodon setting up Sand for you, it lasted the entire game. It wasn't five turns like it is now. Uh, it lasted the whole game until weather got changed by, you know, some other weather. So having the ability for Garchomp to just, you know, a straight up 20% chance to just avoid whatever seriously uh, powerful attack might get thrown at it. Whereas, you know, if a Weavile misses an ice move or whatever, I mean, <laughs> that's GG to that Pokemon. It's just going to get wrecked by Garchomp. And Garchomp's used to run, uh, not all the time, but there were a lot that would run maybe substitute, uh, and sometimes in combination with Bright Powder or Leftovers uh, to give it a better percentage chance of getting a miss because of Sand Veil. So if Garchomp got a sub up and a Swords Dance up, I mean, it was practically GG. So it was just a really, really annoying Pokemon to deal with where even if you gave yourself the best possible chance to deal with Garchomp, not only were you probably going to lose at least one Pokemon, but then you only had an 80% chance to even 
you know, hit through sand veil. So it was just such a stupid, stupid ability from just skill standpoint. It just turned the game into stupid luck based shenanigans. Now remember that stat about Garchomp 2 KOing every Pokemon? Here's the kicker. Many pseudo legendaries were balanced by their four times weakness to one typing, and Garchomp is no different. As with many of its fellow dragon pseudo legendaries, it had a four times weakness to ice, but with a Yacht Berry, only one Pokemon in the entire game could outspeed it and one hit KO it. A choice banded Jolly Weavile. Since the definition of a counter in Pokemon is something that can switch in, take a hit, and then beat the other Pokemon, Garchomp quite literally had no overused counters. Yeah, so this was big back in the days of Smogon, uh, where people were very concerned with the term counters, where a Pokemon needed to be able to switch in and have a really strong matchup against whatever that Pokemon was. So in the case of Garchomp, if you just, you know, if you ever got up a Swords Dance or anything, Pokemon would just get absolutely deleted by Stab Earthquake, Stab Outrage, you know, Fire Fang for coverage. So there really wasn't anything that could switch in safely on Garchomp. It came down to either predicting whether it goes for a dragon type move or a ground type move uh or you know in most cases you would just have to sacrifice a pokemon to try and get it locked into outrage so that you could then send in something like he mentions weavile that could outspeed garchomp and kill it but also this goes back to my original point with garchomp's stat allocation the fact that it was so bulky combined with yachi berry meant a lot of the pokemon that were considered pretty bulky and could get an ice type move to deal with garchomp they just didn't have enough damage to kill it. Even without Yachi Berry, I mean, Cresselia <laughs> couldn't really one-shot Garchomp without significant investment. So it was just such a dominant Pokemon, both offensively, and then that little bit of extra bulk and typing and just the ability to hold a Yachi Berry. It just all combined to make one of the most dangerous Pokemon in singles, you know, of that generation. Weavile got absolutely demolished by any attacks, and other potential quote-unquote counters, Starmie, Gengar, and Deoxys Speed, all failed to one-hit KO Garchomp if it had a Yacht Berry. Also, Outrage would still kill them. It was just Earthquake they could survive if predicted properly. Garchomp would almost always get the setup, and once it's set up, nothing could win the 1v1. That's where those extra defenses made such a big difference. This Swords Dance set was inarguably the most common and powerful set in Overuse. I'm going to spoil things a little bit, but Garchomp actually got banned to Ubers because of this set. Yeah, so actually a lot of you guys might not know this about me. I actually used to play Smogon singles in a ton back in the day. This was in like 2007, 2008, uh, around the very earliest days of BGC. I would grind on, I don't know if you guys remember this. This might date me. It was called Shoddy Battle. It was uh, the simulator after Net Battle. And so I would play tons of games on Shoddy Battle, learn how to play singles, and eventually I got pretty good. Uh, but Smogon used to run what they called suspect tests. So at the beginning of the uh, Diamond Pearl generation, to decide what got banned and what didn't, they would have, I think it lasted maybe like a month, maybe more, I forget, where the top ranked players on the ladder at the end of whatever that period was, a month, two months, whatever, uh, would then get to vote and decide if Garchomp gets banned to Ubers or if it's allowed and overused. And so I would enter all these suspect tests and cast my vote uh one of like yeah i don't know how many it was like 50 maybe back in the day it wasn't really that many pokemon was way smaller back then but uh yeah i actually used to play a lot of singles and i voted in some of those uh suspect tests to decide some of these pokemon if they would get banned to ubers or stay in overused but garchomp really was just absolutely insane back in generation four so what counters were there? Like I said, not any by the actual definition of counter. Certain Pokemon did a better job at beating it with prediction though. Suicune and Slowbro had the bulk and attacking power to switch in and potentially heavily damage Chomp, even one hit KOing it if it didn't have Yacht Berry. The aforementioned Weavile, Starmie, and Gengar could do okay, but weren't true counters. Really, it was Yacht Berry and the fact that Sandstorm would almost always be up that made Chomp so strong. Pokemon that could switch into it like Cresselia or Celebi couldn't kill it and took damage from Sandstorm. Outrage was just such a devastatingly powerful move that it virtually eliminated other Pokemon's chances to do anything. Frequently the plan was just to lock Chump in the Outrage and then send in your Revenge Killer. Yeah, that's actually exactly how we used to deal with Garchomp back in singles in those days. You would sacrifice a Pokemon that Garchomp had to use Outrage against that it couldn't just go for an Earthquake. That way it gets locked into Outrage and then you send out something, you know, maybe a Scarf Pokemon or something that's just naturally faster and can one-shot it. To then revenge kill it so you effectively are trading one for one but that was the thing about garchomp it just almost always was able to at least trade one for one uh with the enemy team 
and depending on how lucky you got with Sandvale or what kind of situation you put yourself in before actually setting up with Swords Dance, Garchomp was just an absolute monster that could sweep through entire teams, but at the very worst, it was at least a one-for-one -one trade, so it made sense why it got banned, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, what a crazy Pokemon in singles at the time. Uh, can't wait to get into the VGC format, because in VGC, Garchomp actually was a lot different. All of that Pokemon transferred over quite nicely into VGC, where Garchomp could play extremely straightforward and rely on its power and great ability to carry it through. Although there wasn't much rooms for Sword Stance setup, a 130 attack stab earthquake is something any team needed to fear. Paired with Zapdos for the famous Disc Quake combo, Garchomp became one of the staples of the VGC 2009 metagame. Dragon Claw was always run over Outrage because you can't choose Outrage targets and doubles. Yeah, so it was played a lot differently. Basically, in VGC, since it was doubles, Garchomp had, you know, really strong spread damage. Uh, and it was also combined with its speed, its bulk. It was just an overall very solid, good stuff type Pokemon. It didn't have the kind of, you know, absolute team sweeping potential that it did in overused singles in Gen 4. Because it was almost never ran with Swords Dance or anything. It was just the overall annoyingness of, uh you know just being fast bulky and an overall good pokemon but it didn't have that kind of single-handedly game-winning potential that it did in singles so despite being you know obviously really good pokemon that was used all throughout vgc history um it just it wasn't the same kind of dominant threat that it was in overuse singles but in October 2012, something huge happened. Garchomp got a new ability, Rough Skin, from Dream World. The Smoking Council unbanned Garchomp from Ubers, but banned Sandville and Snowcloak, the hail version of the ability, under the new Evasion Clause. So that's really interesting, actually, <laughs> and that sounds a lot like uh, what Smogon would do. Now, we used to make fun of a lot of the Smogon decisions as VGC players uh, back in those days, but this is one of them where, like, I mean, it's just such a stupid mechanic evasion especially in the form of sandvale where it's not like it required any kind of skill or anything it just it was in <laughs> there's just no reason to have it it was just kind of silly for game freak to have an ability like that uh so considering it got rough skin then that allowed uh garchomp to still be played and overused but they could just ban sandvale and you know you could still use garchomp you just weren't allowed to get lucky with the 20 percent <laughs> sandvale hacks chance so you know it's a pretty interesting uh decision that they made i had stopped playing singles by this point but it's interesting to learn about you know how smogon decided to allow garchomp into the format but not be as overbearing or as stupid as it was in gen 4. From that moment, Garchomp was once again allowed to run in overuse. The metagame had changed in its absence, but it was still a powerful threat. That signature Yacht Swords Dance set was still terrifying in much the same incarnation, with the only differences being a shift to Fire Blast or Aqua Tail instead of Fire Fang. Likewise, Subsolak made a very strong threat all but guaranteed, only vulnerable to Revenge Killers and Skarmory and Bronzong. Likewise, Choice Sets, whether Scarfed or Banded, fulfilled the same roles as a great Revenge Killer and immediate Kaiju level threat. But Garchomp's 100 102 base speed, previously incredible, was now just above average. Keldeo, Terrakion, Latios, and more were new additions to the overused metagame that outsped Garchomp. Yeah, so this was the generation where Garchomp initially started getting power crept. So he mentions speed-wise that it started getting power crept by some pretty powerful Pokemon that, you know, in VGC, Keldeo obviously not allowed, and Terrakion, I mean, not really a great Garchomp counter regardless, but overall that generation was the first where it started getting power crept and as i'm sure we're going to get into later in the video this is also the generation that brought us landris Terrian form so yeah that was a pokemon that just completely outclassed garchomp at least in a doubles uh standpoint not sure about singles but I guess we'll learn about that. It was also why that Yachtsberry set wasn't the most common chomp around anymore. It finally had things that could beat it. Instead, Garchomp actually fell into using a move distinctly opposed to its nature as a fast and strong sweeper, Stealth Rock. Now that is actually really interesting. Um, and I noticed this in Generation 4 back when I used to play singles. So Metagross was an extremely powerful Pokemon offensively, as I'm sure most of you guys know. And in Generation 3 uh, singles, at least from what I heard, I wasn't around playing competitively at the time, but Metagross was used just as an extremely offensive, powerful Pokemon. But what I noticed, Stealth Rock is given to a huge pool of Pokemon. And so what happened in Generation 4 singles, Metagross ended up just being used as a Stealth Rock setter that could maybe just explode and try and trade one for one while also giving your team Stealth Rocks. 
And it's very interesting to see that in the subsequent generation, Garchomp was used in the same way, where it could set up Stealth Rock and then maybe try and trade one for one. So overall, it could give your team an advantage there. So it's really interesting to see how Pokemon like that uh, are used in so many different roles. Uh, we see the same thing in VGC, where sometimes you see a Pokemon get played one way, and then another person might play it a completely different way. So it's interesting to see that uh, in singles, you see much the same thing. While Garchomp couldn't compete in VGC 2011 because it was Unova Dex only, it most certainly made its mark in VGC 2012. In fact, it won a world championship under the best to ever do it, Ray Rizzle, who won his third worlds using Garchomp. Ray's Garchomp was actually a little bit different from the norm. He used a Bond Berry and a high special defense to resist Draco Meteor Spam from some of the most popular Pokemon in the meta, Latios and Hydreigon. Yeah, so <laughs> I like the shout out there. Um, yeah, so I did use Garchomp a little bit differently uh, in Worlds that year. The way I saw it, Ice moves weren't the most common. Uh, you would see maybe uh, like a Hidden Power Ice on some Pokemon. Uh, Cresselia might have ice well Cresselia usually had ice beam but Cresselia unless it was the offensive expert belt set it couldn't one shot Garchomp anyway and a lot of the hidden power ice users because I was giving Garchomp pretty sizable HP and special defense investment they couldn't one shot it either so the way I thought well dragons are everywhere might as well give it a Hobbenberry so it can survive some Draco meteors so that's what I uh, decided to end up doing but Looking back, um, I'm not sure if it was really the optimal play or even the right play. Uh, I do think maybe going for a max speed build and maybe focus sash or something could have been better. Um, I'm not sure. I never really thought about it in hindsight since I ended up winning, so I didn't care. But yeah, looking back, uh, maybe it wasn't the best set, but that was the logic for it anyway. Dragons were everywhere. I wanted to be able to survive a hit from all the Dra uh, Dragon Gem Draco Meteor users and my set let me do that and i could also at least fire back a dragon claw for decent damage but dragon claw i mean that was one of the things about garchomp in doubles that i didn't mention uh, earlier but uh false Wipe gaming touched on it a little bit in that outrage was terrible in doubles because you couldn't choose your target so people would always opt for dragon claw and that just didn't have the power so pokemon like salamence latios hydragon all the pokemon that would fire off draco meteors uh, those were the ones that would deal serious, serious damage, where Garchomp with Dragon Claw, even super effective, it could almost never one-shot opposing dragons. So it was just kind of that good stuff Pokemon that could be bulky, fast, and deal pretty solid damage, especially spread with Earthquake, which uh, compared to singles actually is weaker uh, because it's a spread move. It, it's not full power the way it is in singles. So that's another reason. But I mean, Garchomp obviously still a good Pokemon. It just wasn't the kind of dominating threat that it was in singles. A more standard Garchomp was seen on 8th place with Junpei Yamamoto, who ran the commonplace max attack and speed EVs along with Rock Slide, but with Focus Sash instead of Yachberry or Dragon Gem. But 5th placer Seijin Park, who has a history of innovating, used Rough Skin Life Orb Garchomp of all things for his high placing. This speaks to the variety Garchomp could use in its many different sets, one of the hallmarks of its iteration. Yeah, so Seijin's Garchomp was really interesting uh, because he went for Rough Skin. There were some, in theory, where if a Pokemon with Focus Sash that made contact could then attack Garchomp, lose its focus sash, and then maybe Garchomp could deal enough damage to kill it, or Garchomp's partner could deal enough damage to kill it. So it was interesting, uh, but at least for me, I had Tyranitar, so there was no reason not to use Sandvale. Uh, and then especially uh, combined with, in my case, I had Substitute. Um, it was, <laughs> I hate it, I hate it so much, but I mean, hey, it works. It's a, it's a way you can get lucky and uh, try and win that way if the worst comes to worst. And even not, Substitute's still a really good move. But uh, yeah, I think looking back again, I'd probably prefer using Jump Pace set. Um, I think the max speed on Garchomp really, really helps it. And then Focus Sash lets it survive those Dragon Gem Draco Meteors anyway. But there were also scenarios where my bulkier Substitute carrying Garchomp uh, you know, was really beneficial. So I don't know, I think both sets are good uh Sajin set is good as well since Sajin had a much more offensive team and he didn't have any sand uh, on his team but that's the kind of thing about Garchomp I mean even though you're running essentially you know the same move set very very similar move set um it can be played in pretty different ways maybe not to the extremes that we saw in singles where it could be played as a stealth rock setter uh it could be played as like a mixed Garchomp or it could be played as like a Swords Dance Sweeper or a Choice Garchomp. There are a lot of 
very, very different ways to play it in singles, but in VGC it was mostly played the same way. There were just some small, small differences that you could play it, but I mean, even those small differences, they, they can really make such a big difference. In 2013, it only had one top eight appearance at World, seventh on the team of Leprox. In fact, that was Garchomp's only top 48 appearance. This was due to the fact of the advent of Landorus Therian, who pretty much provided everything Garchomp did, fast, strong earthquakes in bulk, while also bringing Intimidate. Yeah, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but this was just such a big, big change in terms of Garchomp's role in the metagame. Garchomp was extremely common. It wasn't dominating, as I mentioned, but it was still extremely common, just as an overall good Pokemon. The thing was, as soon as Landorus got uh, released into the format, it was just better in every way. It was also an extremely bulky Pokemon. It was relatively fast, uh, not as fast as Garchomp, but still pretty fast. Had very high attack, higher than Garchomp, and it had very good move pool. And then it had Intimidate, which supports your entire team. So it just became an extremely, extremely uh, good version of Garchomp, a better version of Garchomp that just made Garchomp kind of obsolete. There was nothing Garchomp could do that was better than Landorus, especially since Garchomp was more a ground type attacker in VGC because Dragon Claw was just a pretty weak move. Uh, it was played more as just, you know, use Earthquake, use Rock Slide. Dragon Claw is just there for some you know, decent coverage, and then it's got good stats, good speed. Landorus was just the same, except better. It had Intimidate. So, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of the downfall of Garchomp in VGC. But as I'm sure we're going to get to later in the video, there are formats where Landorus was not allowed that Garchomp was, which allowed Garchomp to have a major, major resurgence. Two pretty big obvious changes we need to talk about in Gen 6 are Fairy Type and Garchomp's Mega Evolution. Fairy Typing actually wasn't as bad for Garchomp as one might think. While Fairy Types of course made great counters to Garchomp, the fact that Fairy is completely immune to Dragon meant that a Fairy Type switch in in fact didn't lock Garchomp into Outrage like a Steel Type would. And Garchomp's Earthquake could still eliminate weakened Fairies, or mess them up big time with proper prediction. So that's actually really interesting from a single standpoint. I didn't even think about the mechanics there where you lock into outrage or well you don't lock into outrage you go for outrage and they switch in a fairy type and you're not locked in so and then with earthquake being stronger in singles than it is in doubles i guess that's enough to knock out some of the really low defense fairy types like uh, guard of wars or maybe a weakened sylveon even so that's pretty interesting I, I didn't know that but in vgc a little bit different fairy type um, yeah, Garchomp's never ran Outrage anyway, and Earthquake being weaker, uh, Garchomp definitely did fall to uh, a lot of fairy types, but it wasn't drastic because at the same time, you know, Steel types became extremely popular to deal with the new fairy types, and of course Garchomp was good against Steel types, so Garchomp was still used. As for the Mega Evolution, Garchomp's attack went to positively astounding levels once Mega evolved, and the additional 20 defense and 10 special defense didn't hurt either. In Sand, that Earthquake was absolutely monstrous thanks to Sand Force, but all that paled in comparison to the loss of 10 points in speed. 10 speed that let Garchomp outrun a huge amount of base 100 threats, like Salamence, both Mega Charizards, Mega Gardevoir, and Mega Metachamp. Yeah, and not mentioned here, but Mega Kangaskhan too. Uh... Yeah, Mega Garchomp was a huge flop. It just wasn't that good. In VGC, anyway. Um, I can't comment on singles. I wasn't playing singles at the time, but... I mean, just the lower speed in exchange for the higher attack and the, in a lot of cases, worse ability because how common Mega Kangaskhan was, in VGC at least, Rough Skin was just better than Sand Force um, a lot of times. So you could deal some pretty significant damage to Kangaskhan's and because Garchomp was faster than Mega Kangaskhan, just using a, a Mega Slot on Garchomp and forfeiting your item because you're running that Mega Stone just wasn't worth it. Garchomp was just better off non-Mega than it was Mega. Luckily for Garchomp, it was native to the Kalos Dex, meaning VGC 2014, which was Kalos Dex only, eliminated its genie competition. While it still had a large number of checks and counters like Scarf, Mega Gardevoir, Salamence, and Hydreigon to worry about, Garchomp made sure everyone knew it was one of the top dogs, or land sharks. Again, with its combination of Earthquake and Rock Slide for spread moves and the always reliable Dragon Claw to hit opposing dragons, its main change was that it usually ran rough skin now, as Tyranitar Heart was a bit less prevalent. Yeah, and as I mentioned just before, um, I'd say that's half right, not 100% right. The thing is, Tyranitar actually was used a decent amount in that format. Um, it's just because Mega Kangaskhan was everywhere, Roughskin was just better. And this was also the first generation where Sand only lasted five turns. It didn't last the whole game like it used to. Uh, 
And so for only five turns of, you know, at most five turns of Sandvale, um, it just was never better to use Sandvale over Roughskin, considering how common Mega Kangaskhan was. Uh, so Garchomp was extremely good that year. It was everywhere. The fact that it could cover Steel types still do the same thing. Pretty good spread damage. Um, and even dating back all the way back in 2012 when I won with uh, Double Dragons, and you'd see Double Dragons a lot that year. Even in 2014, you'd see a lot of Salmons plus Garchomp, Hydreigon plus Garchomp. Double Dragon was still as common as ever, despite the fairy types, just because of, you know, how fast the dragons were, uh, especially Garchomp, and just how much damage they did, and how, you know, effective they were against fairy types. Dragons would all have, you know, fire moves or ground moves to deal with Mega Mawile, which was also really common. And then, of course, Gardevoir didn't have the highest physical defense, so unless it was Scarf Gardevoir, it, it didn't really match up too well against the onslaught of dragon types. Garchomp was used on both finals teams of Worlds 2014. That includes the team of winner Sage and Park, who if you'll remember used the Pachirisu that shocked the world to win the trophy. In fact, it was Pachirisu and Garchomp who formed the winning duel, as Pachirisu enabled Garchomp to wreak havoc without the fear of getting knocked out by opposing Draco meters. How's that for an unlikely couple? But Garchomp was not nearly as surprising as Pachirisu. In fact, six of the top eight teams at Worlds that year used Garchomp, and finals in every division, junior to masters, had a Garchomp on both sides. In fact, Garchomp was the most used Pokemon at Worlds, with 29 of the top 60 players packing it. Only one Mega though. Wow, so I didn't know that. Uh, I knew Garchomp was extremely common that year, but that is literally half the players at Worlds using it. I mean, that's crazy usage uh, stats. So yeah, Garchomp that year was just really, really good. Just, again, it was more as an overall good Pokemon. Being fast, being bulky, you know, it could take a hit from Mega Kangaskhan, deal lots of damage back with Rough Skin, plus either Earthquake or Dragon Claw. And overall, it was just a very, very solid Pokemon. So, yeah, Garchomp, as good as ever. That was maybe the year it was strongest, actually, uh, despite fairy types existing. And that's all because Landorus Narian was not allowed. I'm sure if Landorus Narian form was allowed in that format, despite Ruffskin being so good against Mega Kangaskhan, Intimidate also being really good, I'm sure Landorus would have had very similar usage as Garchomp did that year. So, very, very beneficial for Garchomp's sake that Landorus was not allowed because... Again, Landris just outclasses Garchomp in every way, but it was nice for Garchomp to have perhaps one last year where it could shine as a dominant threat. Although, of course, there was another year where Landris wasn't allowed, and maybe we'll get to that too in this video. Let's see. And that's it. So how good was Garchomp actually? In a word, amazing. Very few non-legendary Pokemon can claim to have been overused every gen since release. Although, to be fair, Garchomp started at 4, but... But yeah, Garchomp is one of the only Pokemon that was even higher than overused at some point. There are very few Pokemon that could be argued to have been game-defining as Garchomp, although I could think of a few in Gen 3. One of the first non-legendaries to be banned, one of the reasons for the implementation of Invasion Cloth, winner of multiple VGC champions, being used a lot, having really high uses in VGC 2017 to either team with or take out Tapu Koko, it was even runner-up last year. And this gets even more dramatic when you realize that the version of Garchomp in overuse is the one without its best ability with Sandvale. With Sandvale, it's disgusting. And unlike some Pokemon who were banned to Ubers and then faltered there, Garchomp could even run with the best Pokemon in the game. Garchomp is bar none one of the best Pokemon ever released in the game, and certainly one of the best non-legendaries. Yeah, so he mentions it there. Um, I don't know, I guess this video is a few years old by now, but uh, yeah, in 2017, Garchomp was also a really good Pokemon and very commonly used thanks to Z Ground. It was just absolutely devastating and again that was a format with no landorus i'm sure if landorus was around garchomp maybe wouldn't have had the kind of usage that it did because landorus again just way better but overall this is not a video about landorus it is about garchomp and false swipe gaming is completely right in his analysis of garchomp it has been an absolutely game defining pokemon and it was just so so dominant especially in singles in gen 4 i mean getting banned to ubers as a non legendary Pokemon at the time that was just unheard of um other than I think it was maybe Wobbuffet was the only other one but yeah Garchomp even in VGC I mean it was really good it was not game defining the way it was in singles in Gen 4 but even throughout the history of VGC um it was just an overall solid Pokemon fast strong bulky what more could he ask for? It didn't have, you know, base 120 power outrages, didn't have base 100 power earthquakes thanks to the mechanics of spread moves and doubles, but it was still a very, very good Pokemon. It wouldn't set up and sweep you in VGC the way it would in singles, but, you know, it was an extremely strong 
Pokemon that could fit in to a lot of teams, especially if you had flying type Pokemon on your team to pair with it. All right, that's going to do it for this week's reaction. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. If so, don't forget to smash the like button, the subscribe button, and ring the notification bell if you want to see more content. I'm also on Instagram if you guys want to catch a glimpse into my life here in Japan. I just got back from Okinawa, so I posted some snorkeling and beach pics there, which really should be on OnlyFans, but hey, you guys are lucky I've only got an Instagram. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.